A warm welcome to everyone who is joining us for this book launch. The book launch is hosted by the Prio Migration Center at the Peace Research Institute uh, in Oslo. And as you all know, we'll be discussing the book Documenting Displacement, Questioning Methodological Boundaries in Forced Migration Research, which has been edited by Katarzyna Grabska and Kristina Grak-Kazak. Uh, Kasia Grabska is a senior researcher here at Prio. Uh, and she'll be moderating the event. A few housekeeping notes from me only before we move on. If you have questions, please post them in the chat at any point during the event, and they'll be picked up during the Q&A later on. And we are recording this event so that other people may also be able to enjoy it at a later point. Thanks, and I'll then pass on to Kasia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marta, very much. Thank you for the uh, for the welcoming and thank you also for the opportunity for us, for Christina uh, Kazak, who is uh, with me today, the co-editor of the book, and uh, some of the authors, uh, Marina Rota, uh, uh, Ocean Uzuru, um, uh, Jose Padilla, and Erika uh, Frilandu. Um, who are going to be part of the launch today to present our book. Um, we're going to also have um, Susan McGrath, who was a reviewer of the book, to, to pose some of the questions and comment on the, um, on the very rich contribution that we want to present to you today. So thank you very much to the Migration uh, uh, Studies uh, Research Center at PRIO for giving us this opportunity. Um, I also would like to say that um, in many ways this book uh, speaks about the research that already happened, that um, the context that uh, we've known for a long time, but it's of course uh, links also to the events that are unfolding right now on the border with Ukraine, in Ukraine itself, uh, but also in other parts of the world that we should not forget. So it's, it's in a way a reminder that uh, questions around methodologies and methods in displacement and forced migration uh, research and in documenting displacement are even more urgent uh, right now to ask. Um, I'm going to present very briefly the overall project uh, and then we're going to move on to the presentation of the two chapters. Uh, so let's start with, uh, with the PowerPoint, so maybe if I can have the um, uh, the second slide, please. Yes, so um, our collective uh, volume that we're presenting today was published by the McGill uh, Queen's University Press, and we thank them very much for this collaboration. Um, the, the, the book is very, very fresh because it came out uh, beginning of February, so, uh, so really um, uh, we are sharing with you uh, this is our second book launch and we are sharing with you um, uh, the other chapters that we didn't present in the first one. Um, and uh, so we would like to thank the, the, the publishers for giving us this opportunity also to, to publish the book relatively fast. The whole project took about two years and it was uh, done really during difficult time of, uh, of COVID. So the authors were really incredible in collaborating with tight deadlines and, and difficult situations in their own personal and professional lives. So thank you all uh, for your incredible commitment to this project. Um, I'll just say a few words how the project came about and what are the main themes that we are addressing in the book. Um, this collective thinking around methodologies and methods that we present uh, in this volume comes from uh, Christina's uh, work for a long time around methods, but also uh, her uh, really important thinking around the ethics of research in the situations of forced migration and displacement. And uh, these are also questions that I've been asking myself uh, during my own uh, research, um, but also thinking about what types of other ways of knowing and how can we do research in a different way, um, in different uh, cross-disciplinary settings? Uh, what, what are the innovative ways of thinking about um, uh, researching displacement, documenting displacement, are emerging um, over the past few years uh, in the field of forced migration research? And this work came out also from uh, some of the work that uh, Cindy Horst, who of course everybody knows at PRIO, uh, and myself, we've been doing um, uh, one of the panels that we organized on methods and methodologies 
uh, at the um, Conference of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration in 2018 was sort of a beginning of collective thinking around uh, um, this volume. And some of the authors who are also present here today participated in that panel that we organized with Cindy. We also noticed then with Christina, who was part of the conference, she was also, um, uh, she also then became the president of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration, um, that there were several other panels uh, during the conference that talked about the different um, innovative methods and new ways of uh, researching displacement. And some of, and, and uh, Erica and uh, Jose, um, there, Erica also presented a paper at the Forced Migration uh, Studies Conference there. So you really see that, that this association brought together a lot of different researchers working in different ways across different uh, disciplinary and geographical boundaries um, together. Uh, so could I, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, the volume um, has about 14 chapters, uh, very different geographical settings, very different methods, very different disciplinary approaches, but speaks to several similar themes. So the first theme that we are really focusing on in the book um, is the idea of uh, the need for uh, looking at ethics, methods and knowledge production in the context of displacement and refugee studies. How, uh, what has been done so far, what are the lessons learned and what are the new ways of thinking that are emerging in, the, um, in this field and across the different disciplines and interdisciplinary approaches that are also coming to play. I think what all researchers and authors in this book do, they really pay attention to the unequal power relations in the co-creation of knowledge and in the creation of knowledge about displacement. And they offer some very critical uh, reflections on crossing these disciplinary boundaries. So we have contributions from um, uh, geography, uh, from media studies, from anthropology, uh, from visual anthropology, from, um, uh, from social work, uh, from health studies, but also from uh, computing and uh, computing sciences. That's one of the chapters that you're going to hear about in a second. Um, another uh, area that we are discussing uh, in the book is the other ways of knowing. So really what type of embodied sensory knowledges uh, we can bring to the discussions of displacement and how important are they in understanding these issues. As I told you, our uh, researchers and contributors come from very different geographical locations, from Sudan, Colombia, um, to Sri Lanka, uh, Australia, uh, the US, Canada, and across different European settings. Um, they also come from different disciplinary settings, as I said, and different positionalities. What I mean in this, that we have some very junior researchers who are about who are starting the field with those who are very established ones and these conversations are happening uh, um, in the book and I think this is also interesting to 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 look how these different uh, researchers and authors look at uh, the themes that we address it. Can I have the next slide please? And now, this ethical commitment uh, that the researchers present to the co-creation of knowledge is central to all the chapters. And all the chapters look at uh, both the kind of innovative and empathetic ways of engaging with experiences of displacement, looking at the complexities of migra migration and displacement experiences across different geographical places. Uh, we have quite a lot of collaborative creative methods and epistemologies that are presented in the book and some of them you're going to hear in a second. What is key in the discussions of all the chapters is how the researchers take very seriously their responsibility as researchers of displacement, uh, as those who document it, acknowledging really strongly that research is both exas exacerbating but also attenuating inequalities in these processes. Uh, the I think in the ethical discussions, what is very rich in the book is this strong commitment to uh, ethical research practice, how to do it. Uh, researchers look critically at their own practices. They talk about things that work, things that didn't work. And I think we've kind of concluded that there is a lot of um, very grounded reflection in the relational ethics of care and solidarity that emerge uh, through these chapters. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So now I'm just going to run through the three main sections that you see in the book. As I said, we have 14 chapters, very different settings, very different methodologies. The, and, and the kind of the three sections uh, are just framing uh, for the book, but uh, the, in a way, some of these chapters could be positioned in two or three sections at the same time. So this is just to guide you through the discussion. So the first set of discussions that we have in the book focus on issues around ethics, power and knowledge. And here you see some of the critical uh, reflexivity discussions and the colonial narratives, for example, by uh, Dina Taha, who is looking at her Egypt, uh, research in Egypt. Uh, we also have um, discussions around ethical and methodological issues of studying um, uh, issues of children in forced migration research. Can I have the next slide, please? The second section uh, deals uh, mainly with uh, creative and collaborative methodologies. And here, this is also a very rich section from contributions from Colombia, looking at uh, sound postcards and the use of sound postcards in research with displacement populations. Uh, the chapter that we're going to hear in a second from Ocean and Marina, looking at graffiti and how we can understand the experiences of refugees using graffiti as a method. Uh, and visual methods such as film and photography, as well as participatory art uh, installations, um, uh, a chapter that discusses issues in uh, Cyprus. And the uh, last slide, please. And the third section looks at uh, crossing methodological and disciplinary boundaries. And here we have contributions from uh, computing sciences. So the chapter that you're going to hear in a second from Jose Padilla. Uh, looking at multimedia packages, very interesting um, uh, method uh, that uh, that was studied with the diaspora, Nepalese diaspora. Looking also at uh, life story narratives through video stories and, and mapping and uh, and work from media studies that looks at uh, digital uh, narrative mobilization. So as you can see, this is a very rich collection with very different chapters. And now I'm going to move on to the um, to the first chapter uh, that it's going to be presented by Osean Uzuru. She's a PhD candidate in educational sciences at Ghent University and a member of the Child Move team. She was part of the Italian study uh, of that research. And uh, Dr. Marina Rota, who is a researcher at Ghent University, and she was also a part. She's also a part of the Child Move project and was um, participating in the Greek uh, study. So over to you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I just want to thank everybody for being here, but most of all, I would like to thank you, Cassia and Christina, for making this happen, and all the authors, of course, who participated in this amazing opportunity, in this amazing work. It is something unique, and uh, I think it will be really appreciated. I, I will give the word to Ocean. Uh, we have a very short uh, timeline, so I just uh, wanted to thank you, Osan. We'll do the presentation. We will both be here for uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, thank you again, Kasia and Christina, for this opportunity to present our work uh, today in this panel, but also to have included in this amazing uh, book. Um, so I will uh, with, we will present today uh, the technique of um, of uh, graffiti analysis. Um, so how to document uh, cross migrants uh, experiences through graffiti analysis. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? OK, so uh, existing studies on graffiti written in displacement focused on the use of graffiti during urban activist interventions to subvert dominant discourses and policies on migration, but also marginalized groups confronting territorial borders through graffiti and place claiming practices. And finally, migrants use of graffiti and memorialization techniques in transients. Uh, next slide, please. And so our study focuses on the later and uh, is driven by the following research questions. So how to capture the moment of being in transit through migrant graffiti writing? What are the functions and uses of graffiti writing by people in context of displacement in Europe? And for that, we rely on a sample of graffiti collected in the framework of the ERC Child Move project within uh, 12 uh, different migration locations in Greece, Italy, France, Belgium and Libya. And uh, based on this sample, we translated into English the graffiti's uh, with the help of uh, independent trained interpreters, two per, per language. 
Um, and we uh, relied on the sample of 518 um, written translated graffiti that were thematically analyzed and coded using NVivo. So the predominant themes were focusing on identities and places, political and social struggle, and collective protection while on the move. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, the, the, the different team talk about uh, migrants' experiences and in the light of the recent event happening in Ukraine, we wanted also to highlight how graffiti um, uh, actually documents that people are fleeing from different contexts, but walk through the same migration path in Europe and sadly produce new generations of both migrants. So you can see here how the graffiti also speak of struggles in different countries. Uh, next slide, please. But also, uh, the graffiti also documents how migrants are aware of the uh, restrictive border and migration policies and, and voice a counter discourse on migration through uh, their expression on the walls. So if you want just to have a look at some of the of the inscriptions. Next slide, please. So if we think about graffiti analysis, there are a few methodological innovations that we can mention. So first of all, graffiti uh, marking allows to reveal the tension between place and movement. It also allows to ground research in places and focus on the embodied experiences of people who have experienced migration and how they relate with their surroundings. Um, it, also, uh, it might also be a response to liminal experiences of waiting and immobility in displacement. We also believe that uh, graffiti is a su suitable complementary tool or even an alternative to traditional qualitative methods who might not be suitable in some interview settings, especially in detention centers. And finally, for those in marginalized and vulnerable situations, graffiti allows one to let the whole world know how you're feeling without giving yourself away. So which also, which also relate to the principle of anonymity in research. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, but there are also many challenges uh, and ethical ones that are also embedded in this in this research method. So first of all, access to graffiti uh, in official settings uh, might be challenging. Uh, we often need to ask for staff clearance. They might also be uh, threatened by destruction, by writing over, placement in dangerous or illegal location, or even by destruction during repeated camp dismantlement. Um, also, the researcher might need a good camera or a good phone uh, and some shooting skills to avoid blurred pictures and pictures off frame that might not be able to be analyzed afterwards. Um, it also requires to take time to be accepted with the camera in the settings where we plan to collect the graffiti, especially for migrant settings where, uh, you know, forced migrants might, might not want to be, you know, on camera or might not feel comfortable with researchers who have camera around them because they might prefer to stay anonymous. It's important to negotiate, to explain also what is the focus and what are the intentions of the researcher and also in, in the best possible way to ask consent to the migrants themselves to take the pictures and of course to ask to the uh, staff personnel in the camps to, to take the pictures of the graffiti. Finally, as a pre-existing materials that are found by the researcher, uh, there is little if no control over data production. Those data for research are here as they are and we have to make to work with it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, it's also there are also many challenges in terms of interpretation of the data. So uh, working with absent participants, anonymous and incomplete data mm, raises a lot of challenges and also a lot of uh, gray zones of, of knowledge for, for the researchers. There is also an ethical risk to associate certain languages with hatred messages or cursing that might create further prejudice for certain groups. Um, and so then also those data might, some data might, might be difficult to interpret without the authors. Examples are drawings and poems who might be embedded in specific cultural interpretations. Um, and for that, it's important also in the analysis process to work with independent trained interpreters with appropriate linguistic and cultural skills to check both the accuracy of the translation and the possible cultural interpretations of the findings. Um, and also it's important to remember that the interpretation of the graffiti sample depends on the researcher's social, historical and cultural situatedness. So for, as to say, a, a European researcher might not read 
uh, the graffiti the same way than, than the researcher which might be located in other part of the world and who have grown up in different with the different um, imaginaries or cultural uh, background. And so it's also important to remember that the knowledge that is produced is situated and restricted to the dynamics and realities of precarious migration routes toward and within Europe. So we cannot we can't pretend that these graffitis and their content is also applicable to other migratory routes in uh, in African countries or other continents, uh, US or other migratory routes. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you for your attention. That's it for us. And uh, we are very looking forward to the discussions and uh, some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ocean and Marina will come back to the questions in a second. So please, in the meantime, if you have questions already, you can uh, write them in the chat. And now we're going to move on to the second uh, presentation. Um, uh, we have with us uh, Jose Padilla, who is a, a research associate professor at the Virginia Modeling Analysis and uh, Simulation Center at Old Dominion University in the US. And I also see, so he will present, but I also see Erica Freeland uh, with us, um, who is the co-author of the chapter, and she's the research assistant professor at the Virginia Modeling uh, Analysis and Simulation Center at the same university. So, Jose, you. Thank you, Cassia. I appreciate it. Um, uh, the idea of the presentation today, just to provide you some context of what you will be finding in the book, um, the presentation is methodology focused, so I, I try to make it as generic as possible with some highlights of as they apply to displacement. Uh, there is, I, I usually have a lot of slides, but I, I try to go very quickly. I speak too fast, so every now and then I have them just in case. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, if there is, I would like at least two things to be taken with you today. One of those is that we all do modeling. It's just that we all do different types of modeling, and I will try to elaborate on that. The same thing about simulation. We all do some form of simulations. It's just that we just do it different ways. Uh, in this particular case, if there, uh, something that I would like you to take with you is that this idea that simulations help us to answer the what if. Uh, next, please. Some context. Uh, this is there are many definitions for what a model is. In this case, I will just propose that he just said, these are artifacts that capture how we understand reality and our, our imaginations. Uh, in the scientific context, we care about reality in this particular case, but uh, other pieces of work at some point are also considered within models. Next, please. So for instance, some of these examples we relate to, we have science fiction. Uh, Dune, for instance, that is very uh, commonly uh, heard lately, it's just a model of what the future would look like in 20,000 years from now, uh, something of the sort. Uh, we have seen representation on, in caves, uh, uh, artifacts, basically people painting how they see or how they understand reality. We have migration timelines, something that allows us to say, well, you know, if how a situation evolves through time, considering different events and different actors. Uh, we do have models that have that have withstood the test of time until they were proven not truthful. In this case, we talk about the geocentric model of planetary movement. It was a model that was considered very useful. And I always point to this to this idea of usefulness and truthfulness when it comes to models. But in this particular case, it was a useful model, but it lasted. It's just that ultimately a truthful model came about and now we have an altering model. Uh, we're talking about simulations, of course. Uh, those are artifacts, those are modeling artifacts. And we do have, let's say, uh, get flight control, flight simulators. Again, those are artifacts that allow you to control a virtual entity with an input of a human being. Next, please. So I I'll start with simulating in this case. Simulating, I'll define it in this case of using a simulation for experimentation. So what we do uh, almost, I, I would say, often is that what, I, what we think about is scenarios of what 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 should I do if I let's say I go out and I take a car, I take a subway, or I take my bicycle. So each one uh, presents to you with a series of options that you eventually often run through your head. So if they say there is something, there is rain, there is a traffic jam. If there is rain, they're going to be flooding, or you may need. To, and, and in that type of scenarios, they say that you want to go, let you go in late, that you're going to find traffic that you may find by a school zone. All those scenarios run in your head. I don't know how often, but they do. 
uh, at least they do they run through mine uh, in terms of selecting the best route for me to go from point A to point B. Next, please. This is another exercise that people like doing is that what about if I win a million dollars? It's the same exercise. Uh, it's nothing different than what we're talking about. It's just what if I'm winning a million dollars? So these are different options, different paths for people to start thinking about it. The challenge with something like this, though, is that we, we often run out of imagination. And that's usually what simulations provide a, 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 an aid in terms of reducing the level of complexity. So if I were to take the model of how Bill Gates, uh, Mark Cuban, and et cetera, being able to maintain and generate wealth, this is something that will be an instance, a person that I would try to simulate what somebody is like in order to be able to adopt it to that particular scenario if I wish to do so. Next. In this particular case, in the Coxus, in the context of displacement, this was a model that we built back in the day. Um, the, the objective with this model was trying to understand the accumulation of Syrian displaced in Turkey uh, in the context of durable solutions. So what this provided to us at the time was this idea of give us a baseline, a baseline meaning what if situation stays as they are. We have the regular flow as it was happening back in the day, and in terms of repatriation or resettlement races stay at the at, the, at that given moment. So at that given moment, it gave us some information. Basically, it allowed us to project into the future what that level of accumulation would be and in what type uh, of uh, accumulation type, uh, basically, the numbers will look like. Uh, what this allows, as we're talking about in the what if scenario, is that what if the numbers increase? What about what if uh, there are new initiatives for uh, resettlement. What if? So we start thinking about all these particular options and that allows us to experiment with, with, with this artifact without having to go and expect what's happening in reality. It will allow us to see what may be ahead and plan accordingly in that particular aspect. Next. So what do we do it? Uh, what do we do simulating? I, and I try to highlight some of the, these are just but few examples, by the way. We, it provides a structure, uh, allows to provide a structure, it allows to experiment with, and it, and it gives you a set of results, something that we might be able to analyze using a statistic or using just visual interpretation. In what context do we use it? We use it when something is very dangerous or, or a place where we don't have access to. Uh, it, has, it allows to address some ethical challenges. Uh, of course, it definitely is on the complex side, um, but it also provides an opportunity for communication. So on this aspect, we usually focus on the complexity and the challenge that it provides on generating that structure. It's not trivial, but it is doable. And this is where we usually have uh, kind of uh, disagreements in terms of how these tools or these artifacts are actually used. Um, one example, for instance, or a model that we worked back in the day is how, what, will, what, what will be the evacuation process when you have a, a terrorist attack, including a a dirty bomb, a bomb laced with nuclear material. Or when we're talking about displacement in Congo, that was another uh, work that we did back in the days, that where will people go? So something like this are places that are difficult to access, that provide certain ethical challenges because you're not going to put a bomb in the middle of anywhere. So it gives us a sense of what would happen if that situation were to be presented. Next. As I mentioned initially, when we talk about modeling, we, we, uh, we, we can talk from everything from a drawing on a cave to E equals MC squared. Uh, I wanted to highlight the word that Sashini and Danesh presented last week and the same thing that Ocean presented today, that what we see in this case, are, these are just models. These are just the way people see their reality and that's the way that they understand the reality. It's just that those are the means that they represented. So again, we all do this. We all are capable of doing it, just that we need to arrive at some point. What are the ones, at least, uh, from my perspective, one of the uh, one of the efforts that we have worked on is how what would be the the level of what would the artifact be that it facilitates the communication in between engineers, um, professional uh, scholars in the social sciences. It's about really arriving to that trade off in terms that we can facilitate that communication. So we're able to say, well, you know, I see what you're saying. Let me show you what I the way that I see it. So we're arriving to something to to a place in the middle, meaning that. For instance, as I mentioned initially, uh, when I when I was looking at the when I when we were watching the previous presentation of the Sashini and Danesh, for me it spoke greatly when I saw the video of the migrant life story. 
because that's not unlike the way that we start drawing a model. We start with a piece of paper and we start trying to have an idea of the evolution through time. So to me, it spoke very highly when I saw that video. So in a sense that what I'm trying to say is that we do have common ground where we're able to work together at some point. So in this case, we do have again different examples. Uh, I put again the geocentric model, a heliocentric model. And for me, these are fantastic examples because in one you do have a model that was useful but not truthful. On the other one, you have a model that is truthful and extremely useful. So it tells about the powers of model, even if they are wrong, they are, they are very useful as long as you know, of course, that they're wrong. Next, please. So what do we do in this case with modeling? And I think that modeling presents, in this case, when I'm referring to modeling in this particular case, I'm referring to the modeling where we are able to have an overlapping of interest. A model that is a, a drawing, a model that is just a simple diagram, a model that allows us to have a timeline, something that we're able to have a discussion on. So it presents a great opportunity in terms that we are able to move it into in a form that is as structured as possible. So we're able to transmit this information to somebody else. And again, it provides an opportunity in terms of communicating. It facilitates communications among parties, across parties. It's less complex. Uh, definitely uh, it's an opportunity that at some point we're still discussing, we can talk about experiences, subject matter experts, etc. The challenges become that we kind of experiment some of these models, which we cannot generate any type of results from that type of model. So, but still, they are very useful. And these are models that we have been working over the last several years in an attempt to understand across domains. Next, please. So how do we use them? And in this case, I'm going to go to some specifics. So, uh, I won't read the whole slide to you, but ultimately we go by the, the constraints that we have. If we have type and availability of data and theory, if you have data, if they say you have quantitative data, for instance, fantastic, you can use a statistical approaches, statistical models. If you don't, you have qualitative data, it's more like how do we use that data to be able to create a representation that would inform you and would inform the process of building a model. We don't have to arrive, and this is an important uh, mention that I would like to say is that we don't have to arrive to a simulation. For instance, we do use simulations to help us think. We don't we don't use them. We don't we don't seek simulations per se. They're just artifacts that help us think and explain something. As such, each model provides a perspective that complements or challenges explanations. Next, please. Okay. These are some examples. These examples come from a funded work that we have with the Minerva Initiative for the last few years. In this case, we see data that comes uh, on the right side. We do have a, the squiggly model, the node network looking model. That was something that was creating use in theory. The model below is something that we're now collecting data on using surveys. The one on the left bottom is just uh, network models that use funding, a stream of funding to places like Colombia or Greece that tell us how much uh, funding and evolution of funding through time is providing. Above it, we do have data that is coming from analysis of newspapers. And what we did with these newspapers that we have an statistical analysis at the time of the time series generated by the frequency of coding generated from those newspapers. So there is a variety of those. Next. Jose, you have one minute remaining. I'm just, just about to finish. Oh, My sorry. final thought. We just need to arrive to a common language for communication and collaboration, and ultimately it's us to decide what's the language that we need to use. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jose and Erica. Uh, um, I see also other authors who are present in the audience. I see Georgia, so we can also, uh, those of you who want to ask, ask uh, questions later on. Um, yeah, there are also other authors who can contribute to the discussion. So now we'll go to uh, to our distinguished reviewer of the book and we have with us Professor Susan McGrath. She's Professor Emerita in the School of Social Work and uh, at York University and resident scholar at York Center for Refugee Studies and a member of Order of Canada. And of course, uh, someone who has been so influential behind the uh, International Association for the Study of Forced Migration that in a sense brought us all together here. Susan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us despite the early hours. And the word is now to you. Thank you, Kasia. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, I am very pleased to be a reviewer of this book and to comment on it today. Uh, it's a book that challenges us and guides us to completely rethink how we do research with people on the move. And it's a book that is re relevant not only to migration researchers, but to all who want to do innovative 
and ethical research. As Cassia said, they brought together researchers who have been working with innovative research methods, but they asked them to reflect on different ways of knowing, on less hierarchical approaches, and carefully considering the ethical dilemmas that are involved in such research. It proposes new ways of thinking about research, which people have been displaced, and it promises to improve the quality and the practices and the effectiveness of our research knowledge with its multiple unique examples of research methods. And these are methods that seek to co-create knowledge with those experiencing displacement in innovative ways that effectively engage the participants in the process of knowledge production while addressing the power imbalances between research and participant. This is a really crucial perspective and we, we learn a lot in this book about this. The focus is on a more ethically relational approach to research, not only in the creation of the knowledge, but in its dissemination. Participants are invited to talk about how this knowledge is going to be presented and to whom. The authors are from cross dis disciplines, as noted, and they're working with different migration populations in different political and geographical contexts along the path of displacement. This unique piece about looking at them in transit today that we heard from Oceana. They're typically using participatory arts based methods, but are not commonly used. They're clear about the challenges of doing critical, inclusive research, and they reflect on the ethical dilemmas that they are facing in doing these different approaches. The book invites researchers to further explore innovative methods guided not only by the procedural ethics of our academic institutions, but a relational ethics that more fully considers the positionality of the research and the interests of those who have been displaced. You know, we've been trained to be researchers and to be able to present to our institutions, you know, exactly how we're going to do this. And but today, what we're hearing about in this book, how to be creative. Uh, and the authors also are highlighting the tensions in their work and reflect on these challenges of building these kinds of sustainable relationships in research and praxis. And engage in the politics of knowledge production. Indeed, the contributions to this book illustrate that iterative reflexivity is necessary to understand our positionality within hierarchies of knowledge, both in high level policy discussions as well as within the politics of everyday life. We've heard about Jose talking about this emerging modeling of one method of modeling and simulation. And Oceana's and Marina's work about using graffiti, but looking at people in transit, it's an area that hasn't been well looked at. It's very interesting. I also want to comment in the final chapter on exhibiting displacement by Vrapi Shatspanigatidu and Fiona Murphy. They propose a method of methodological dubiety in the context of displacement. And I don't know about you, but I had to look up the word dubiety. And it is a state of uncertainty. They describe themselves as methodological and ethical shapeshifters, practicing an ethnography that resists, protects, and advocates far, far beyond what institutional ethics would have us do. So in summary, this book tells us to first to attend to the specific politicized context in which we work. And as uh, Kasia noted at the beginning, you know, we've got displacement in multiple contexts and around the world today. To be creative and innovative in these contexts of immobility and mobility. And finally, to continuously question the ethics of the methods and the motives of our research. All 14 chapters demonstrate an ethics of care and respect. I urge you all to get this book into your libraries to help you, your colleagues, your students to rethink how we do research. Um, we're going to open this up to a Q&A from all of you, but I would like to ask our authors to elaborate further about doing research in this state of uncertainty, of being a shapeshifter how you've been able to shift from more traditional methods of being the knowing researcher to conducting research or taking on the state of uncertainty and being able to see the potential or the creativity of not knowing. I think uh, Jose has spoke to this, it seems to be built into the process of modeling and simulation. But Oceana, how you've taken up this research, really looking at states of transition that haven't been looked at before and the challenges around doing that kind of work. So I wonder if you can talk each of you talk a little bit about how you move from being this researcher, how we're trained to be researchers and sort of traditional methods of being the knower and then to put yourself in the state of not knowing, the state of uncertainty 
uh, and be willing to engage with your participants. Even if you don't know your participants, I think Hoshihan is a challenge. You, they're, they're completely anonymous to you. And I think for you, Jose, looking at uh, working with in a camp, having a computer researcher walk into a refugee camp as you did in Greece, how that you were received and how you negotiate those relationships and those boundaries. And uh, you mentioned that working with, you know, qualitative researchers. So how do we, how do you work and talk, talk a bit more about how you work in these states of uncertainty and exploration and, uh, but with the goal of all, always being creating research that ethically and sound and reflects the knowledge of those who we're trying to work with. You want me to go first, Osia? So, so let me just say thank you so much, Susan, for these comments. So now we'll move on to the to the question and answer uh, part and the discussion part. Uh, uh, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, no questions for now. So please uh, see uh, see if you have questions and and uh, feel uh, feel free to add them. Uh, and maybe we start. Uh, with your comments. Um, Jose, do you want to start? And then maybe Ocean or, yeah, let's start with Jose, yes. Okay. Um, there, there are different point, uh, There are different ways of answering that question, so I'm gonna make it brief. One, uh, at least in the way that we work as a group, we complement each other in terms of perspectives and how we see when we go, let's say, on field work. We also we often observe things a little bit differently. It's just that we have a lot of overlapping uh, that facilitates the the transition, let's say, of qualitative work or quantitative work into a form of model. Uh, the second part to that is that as we are not tied to any particular methodology, we are able to to shift depending on the ability of data and or access to people. So, for instance, during pan during the pandemic basically over the last two years, we were supposed to do field work on all these three places. But what we did immediately shifted to say, well, how we can how we can connect and work with our colleagues on site. So they're able to facilitate interviews on site. So we actually have, if I, if I, will, I would like to say, a very good experience interviewing people in Colombia, interviewing people in South Africa, and everything was done through it through Zoom, which actually made it easier for us because it provides the recording and facilitates the transcription process. So we, we kind of streamlined that, that process that would have been a little bit tedious coming back from field work. It actually makes it a lot easier for us. So in that aspect, we managed to overcome some of those limitations of so not being there. And, and we are able to overcome some of those challenges. Yeah. Um, from our side, so I will I will talk about my own experience, and then I will let Marina talk about hers uh, in the in the Greek part of the study. But uh, for us, uncertainty was I think from the beginning, uncertainty and unpredictability was at the beginning of our at the core a core aspect of our project because um, this graffiti study is embedded in the in the bigger child move project with which aims at following uh, and accompanying minors trajectories across Europe. And, and the study shows that uh, those trajectories took unexpected turns and twists. So as researchers, as field researchers, we, we met those young people and we, we intended to follow them wherever they would go. And, and some of them didn't even know where they would go. So we, we, put it, we were ourselves in this position we, where we depended on them and where they were the leaders of our, of our research. So I think in that sense, it first, uh, counter like counter the, the power and balance that was experienced in some ways because we were we we had to let it go we had to accept the fact that we were not in control of uh, of this research in a way and that's the same thing for the graffiti that we collected because they are here for everyone to be seen they are not just for researchers everybody they are available for everyone in most cases but it depends on how the reader interpret them and how the reader decide to make use of them and what we want to look at it through through those testimonies because I we really see that as I personally see that as an archive of of testimonies of specific experiences, an open archive that is here for everyone. And and depending on who we are, we will see different things, of course. Um, and also regarding the um, not knowing and anonymous participants, I think it's also a powerful way 
again to counter traditional ways of, of doing research when researchers ask uh, participants to <laughs> extract a lot of information, sometimes private ones. And now we are in the situation of, well, this is what you got and this is what you have to do. This is the material we are giving you and then you have to deal with it. And in that sense, I think it's it's a very beautiful way to accept that we should not be always in control um, and, 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 and accept the fact that knowledge cannot be complete and accept that this kind of data and given the situation of uncertainty where those people are found, it's okay not to know everything. So that's that's how I see it personally. I, I will let Marina just give her own perspective on this. Yes, I couldn't agree more with you, Osan. I just uh, want to to uh, pay some attention in in the graphic itself because in every research, if that either you do field research or you're doing um, a participant observation, you do interviews, you have an interaction. You're there and uh, you interact uh, with your environment or you, with your participants. With graffiti, it is just action and it is something that you do uh, that is nothing and nobody there to, to uh, respond to this action. And it is very subjective because uh, you see something and you find it beautiful and you take a picture or you see something that you don't understand what it says and uh, because of the setting, because it is in this specific setting, you decide to take a picture. Then you just wait for, for your research to be revealed. You really don't know what you have collected. So um, it has its own um, beauty, let's say. It, is, it, was, uh, it was a surprise sometimes, the Socian said at her presentation, we were not happily surprised uh, seeing just the uh, people cursing or just writing some uh, weird, uh, yeah, argo in in their own uh, language that we couldn't interpret in any way. In other cases, uh, we 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 found out poems, uh, poems in shelters with an accompanied minors, and uh, then you you look at the wall, you take the picture, and then you realize that it is a sad poem, which was uh, amazing for us to to realize that. I think the part of uh, graffiti had uh, a beauty and uh, a force by itself in our research. It's not typical, of course, it's not typical, but uh, but it was uh, a unique experience. I think there's a question. I don't know if you want to respond to it now specific to that about uh, when you're coding, do you consider where the graffiti is located and how this may further impact the message? such as graffiti in a public place versus more private or less accessible settings or near a government entity? Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, it, it, it's a very important question because, um, for example, we found graffiti in, uh, in, in Libyan detention centers. So, of course, it, we cannot, we, we found graffiti in, in um, you know, uh, migrant settlements in, uh, in uh, Ventimiglia or in, uh, in Rome. And, and also it's, 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 I think it's important to see how the the, the the setting influence what is what is said because for example in the in the Libyan detention centers we found a lot of there there were a lot of political messages uh, of course about detention about about uh, fear the feelings that were expressed also were um, focusing on despair um, on on, um, on on hope as well but also on um, on basically migrants were writing down the difficult situations they were going through and 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 it was it was it was a bit of it's it's a very bittersweet feeling it's 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 difficult to read those messages and as readers we we cannot uh, forget where this where this expression comes from of course most of those graffitis were found in border places um, where migrants journeys are interrupted, uh, where they might be intercepted or, or victims of physical abuse. And, and this is also a story of border escapes. It's also the story of how we, we, we interrupt their journeys, how um, policies interrupt their journeys. And I think it's in that sense, um, uh, it's th those codings and, and those graffitis are a really unique way for migrants to express their voices while they might not be listened in, in other instances or in other settings. So these are really grounded uh, discourses in a way. 
Um, I would like to add to that that uh, depending on the place, we could see, of course, a different um, content in the in the graffitis. Uh, for example, in uh, in a, in a shelter with for unaccompanied minors, that it was more structured and everything. You could see a graffiti about better Wi-Fi. But uh, in a detention center in Libya or in a detention center or under a bridge of Antimilia, then you will see other messages. Uh, most of the times more uh, emotional than than the ones in the structured uh, areas. Also, the quantity of uh, graffiti would change because, of course, if you're allowed to to write on the walls, you might find more graffitis than if you're uh, if, if, if there are rules that prevent people of writing on the walls, because, of course, gra writing graffiti is an illegal practice at first, so it's you might not be able to do it in every setting, of course. So but there is a question from Georgia. Um, so she says, I like the public nature of graffiti and its use of spaces. Can you comment on the politics of space? And I would also turn this question to Georgia because you also speak about that in your chapter. And then there is one more question uh, uh, from Lydia, uh, who says, thank you all for these presentations. I think the use of graffiti is very interesting because of, of its non performance. I wonder how do you think this may affect the construction of realities over time as this change are painted over renewed and how might your work interact with this temporality? So uh, Ocean and Marina, do you want to comment briefly on these other on these two questions and then we go to Georgia? Um, yes, so um, the, the, the aspect of uh, non-permanence is uh, actually very important and that's also something that we discussed in the chapter, uh, especially the fact that yeah, the, the, there is this ephemer ephemerality of, of uh, graffiti that we found, and especially for the graffiti that we have found in uh, in uh, camp settings, but mi migrant settings, because especially also for in humanitarian camps, they might not be built to to last, so they might disappear. The migrant settlements are often, um, you know, um, dismantled. Uh, most of the graffitis that were collected in the, the camps were actually disappeared so it's also capturing a very transient reality and and um, also reality that that there is this public um, uh, public struggle uh, around what is part of the collective memory what is supposed to stay in the urban space and what has to disappear and I think this kind of, of graffitis the fact that we managed to 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 capture and immortalize this uh, those graffiti actually speaks about the the permanence of 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 it, and the fact that we managed to have it as a, as pictures might also give opportunity to think about an archive at some point, how to create a virtual archive of all those graffitis because we know that they might not last forever, um, and and also it's an additional challenge when we conduct such research, we have to act quick and if some people have some pictures of graffiti that were found it's also they were sending it to us for example to to build our archive of graffiti and um and yeah that's a that's a very important challenge but it's also very exciting to work with it in a way yeah marina if you want to add something it's okay okay and i think there was another question about the politics of space um in that sense um Sorry, I don't remember exactly the question. Um, the, yeah, the sorry. use of space, yeah. yeah. The use of space, yes, the politics of the space. Yeah. So I think I kind of responded to that question as well when I talked about, you know, urban uh, urban collective memory and how some, and it, how it's part of this element. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to, to both of you. And there's a question from Christina to uh, Jose and Erica. I, I suppose Jose will be the one responding. Uh, could you speak to the potential use of the modeling and simulation in the current situation of Ukraine, as uh, this is such a hot issue at the moment, including the ethical issues related to the prediction of mass migration? Uh, and you have to unmute. Sorry, you're still mute. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sorry, um, there are two aspects to that two points. Uh, one, uh, currently we don't we don't seek predictions with the models that we build. We're trying to under use them for our gaining understanding and for providing explanations. Second, uh, we do have from the work that we have done, 
we have a, a simple model. In this case, a simple, I don't want to say simple. We have a model that provides an explanation of this type of situation. Uh, our focus on our research was what, how does the situation evolves from you start seeing large arrivals to a place and evolves over the first few years. So from that work, we have been able to identify some indicators and some, uh, how you said, some sequence of events that we are trying to see how we are uh, observing the situation and see how much of those events are uh, are observed as they occur. I think that we still have some time to go, of course, because it's just starting. But situations like, for instance, the massive support of of uh, citizens in terms of uh, people being displaced. This is something that we observe, at least that we have documentation from Greece in particular, for instance. So there are some elements that we are seeing now that we are able to document from the previous cases that we have observed. So in that sense, we do have a model. We can we can convert and we have attempted to put those models into simulation. It's just that there are limitations, as I mentioned to you before. Simulations, they, they are not we don't try to use simulations all the time because they are very labor intensive and they are complicated to build even on them. However, the element of, the, of using them to arrive to a model and explanation, of course, and this is something that we're currently working on. There is, uh, thank you, Jose. There is a question from, uh, another question from Georgia. Apparently, Georgia is unable to unmute herself, so she cannot really comment. Uh, from her study. Um, so she says it is so innovative, uh, Jose, for social scientists to collaborate with computer scientists. It is so refreshing to hear about modeling in the context of documenting displacement. <clears throat> and emerging methodology is augmented reality. Would you be able to say something about using modeling and augmented reality together as research methodologies? Absolutely. Um, uh, we have uh, we have started discussion. It's just it's a matter of again, it's a matter of time. Uh, with colleagues in the building that work with augmented reality and virtual reality. So one of the examples, for instance, that we wanted to to start that we started a discussion on, but we never finished. It's more like what about using these devices to provide some <clears throat> uh, at least empathy, for instance. You could say, well, can you put yourself on the foot on, on the on the on the position of somebody that is going through this situation? So it is my belief. Again, we haven't had any chance to explore this avenue. That these type of tools may provide some insight. So absolutely, I think that technology is there to aid, uh, and I think that there is a, there is a lot to be done in terms of be, um, of using them for the benefit of the work that we are trying to do. Thank you. I'm just wondering, Christina, if you also want to say something uh, from uh, from us as editors and from your per point of view related to some of the questions that were asked already or some other feature of uh, of the of the book in general, and then maybe the chapters that we haven't discussed today. Um, thank you, Kashan. Thank you for moderating today. Um, so maybe I can come back to Susan's sort of overarching comment and question about the uncertainty and how do we adapt to the uncertainty. And I think that all of the chapters um, are very humbling in the sense that they acknowledge that researchers cannot and should not have full control over the process. And I think this is what makes it so refreshing because I think in many methods, textbooks and courses, um, and even in journal articles, you know, we in the methodology section, we always try to sort of package it as if somehow it all flowed according to plan. And that's not the reality of research, and it's definitely not the reality of research in these um, forced displacement contexts that we're working in that are very mobile, unpredictable. But I also think there's a normative ethical question about should this be the model of research? And I think that uh, researchers in the book really challenge us to recenter and and refocus on the lived experience of forced migration and to give control in this co-creation and co-production of knowledge to the individuals involved. So from the one of the first chapters of Dina Taha that's talking about decolonizing knowledge, I mean, her chapter really shows that decolonizing is also about giving up control and acknowledging that you don't have all the answers to the very last chapter um, that talks about um, from Aaron Gongliv, um, 
um, about how we can think of words and the words that we use having power and making sure that we're using the words in the way that the participants actually want us to use them and, and um, giving agency to people to explain their own experiences. Um, so, um, I mean, it, it's hard to summarize such a rich book and this is why we're having these series of events. Um, and I know that we're running out of time, but this has been such a rich discussion and thank you so much to all of the participants uh, for coming um, and for the questions and the presentations today. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much to all of you. I think I will add just one more thing before we close. Uh, what I found also in this experience so crucial is not only about giving up control, but also acknowledging how this knowledge is shifting, how the co-production of knowledge is a shifting experience. So in a sense, uncertainty, Susan, to go back to your question, remains. And I think, you know, as we live with uncertainty as every, everyday life's experience, part of everyday lives, I think in the knowledge creation, that's also such a key term to remember. Knowledge, I think, traditionally was meant to freeze things and, and make them certain. And I think this book shows that to do that is to deny the reality, as Christina said, of those lived experiences, also of people going through these experiences of displacement. So uh, I would like to thank all of you really from this uh, incredibly uh, rich discussion and, and perspectives. Uh, thank you to Marina, to Ocean, to, to Jose, to, to Erica, who was with us online, to Georgia, who was with us online, and to Susan for your, uh, for your really, uh, for reading the book so closely, for offering the comments, and for also pushing us to think further. I think these discussions also push us to continue this, 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 this discussions that we started in the book, and I'm looking forward to the next events that we are planning for the book and inviting all of you to, of course, read the book. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for being such a wonderful colleague on this project. I, I always have, I have to say that, so. <laughs> uh, and thank you to Prio, thank you to Marta Erdel, and thank you to all of you for your presence today.